Hi, I'm Pam Gothar with Social Studies School Service. Delighted to have you joining us for this afternoon. Today we're going to be talking about uh, particularly working with students who uh, are from generational poverty. So as we get into our session tonight, I'd like you to know, uh, your microphones have been turned off. However, there is a chat feature on the right hand side of your screen, and I'd love for you guys to be able to use that chat feature with me. You can post comments or questions. And in fact, one of the first things we're going to do is I'm going to be asking you to share some comments with me. So go ahead and be looking for that, uh, for that chat button so that you guys can engage with me this afternoon. So as we're talking about the diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, we're really focusing tonight on those who live in poverty. And we're going to be particularly talking about those who are in generational poverty. <clears throat> Our outline is first kind of talk a little bit about poverty and what it is, what you think of when you think of poverty, uh, the effects of poverty on the brain, and we're going to talk a little bit about how poverty impacts student behavior, and then how growth mindset and the things that we do as teachers can positively impact those students and their brains. And then we'll look at pedagogy that motivates and engages students of poverty. So our first question that I'd like you to join me in tonight is, when you first think about poverty, just what comes to mind first? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about poverty? Shoot me a chat and let me see what you've got on that. Oh, wow, thank you, Gail. Hungry children. We all probably go to a different place as we think about poverty. Thank you for that. No money, right. Gary, that's the one that kind of comes to my mind first too, is just the fact that there is an absence of money. As we think about poverty though, in terms particularly of generational poverty, when I say generational poverty, I'm referring to people who are second generation or more of people who have lived in poverty and for the most part have gone to the mailbox and gotten their checks in that format. So we're talking about generational poverty here. When I think about poverty, not only do I think of the empty pockets and no money, but I also think of the places where they live. I think of houses that aren't as well maintained perhaps as they should be. I think about houses even like this. I know all of you have seen families living in even uh, this type of condition or worse. These people in poverty are, are minus more than just money. They're minus or lacking of resources in general. They live in conditions like this. Some even live in their cars. When we think about poverty, we also think about homeless people. And again, we're talking about an absence of more than money, but an absence and a lack of resources in general without having maybe uh, family members to turn to who can take them in and absorb that additional person but a lack of resources in general. I don't know about you guys, but I've seen this kind of sight often of people standing in line, uh, waiting for a meal or waiting to get free food to take back to their families. So that absence of money causes poor living conditions. It causes the lack of food. And as you said, Gail, hungry children. It causes children to live in sometimes unsafe living conditions and to even play in unsafe uh, playgrounds. So let's take a look at that generational poverty and look at what it does include beyond that idea of the lack of money. It can be the lack of skills, the lack of ability to know how to handle challenges within the family unit. 
while abuse occurs on all socioeconomic levels, it does occur, occur more frequently in households in poverty where people don't have the ability to articulate in a conversation. They don't have the ability of solving problems other than sometimes quick reactions. And that goes not only for in the family, but even sometimes on the job. Um, just a quick little story. I was at a restaurant recently and I saw the cook just have a flare up similar to this at another employee. And it's just that lack and inability to keep oneself from just lashing out. They do that. That comes first to them. They just reach, they react in uh, those situations in a more uh, aggressive manner. Poverty means uh, either lack of transportation or lack of reliable transportation. Oftentimes people who are in poverty encounter car problems and that when they get those car problems, their cars may have to sit and not get repaired right away. And be thinking about how all these things impact our students. And of course, children, when they're in the homes of people who don't know how to um, handle disputes or arguments in a, uh, a more democratic way, they often result to the arguing and the fighting and children hear the fighting, they hear and see the arguing, they lose sleep, they become fearful. So all of these factors, these kind of chronic uh, stressors are what children in poverty often face. Eviction is another one. For children in poverty, a number of them will go home this year and find that they've been evicted from their dwelling. And when you have that lack of resources, you don't have that money not only to pay the rent or get caught up, but you may lack the resources to have friends who have a pickup truck or you can't just go out and get a moving van and come over and get your own resources. So while they're sitting on the street, neighbors and passerbys stop and pick through the things that are sitting there, leaving the evicted family even uh, more distraught than they were. And children come to school. Children come to school and they stare at our textbooks and we don't know what's going on in their brains and they're sitting there, they're hungry they're uh, sleep deprived, and there's a lot more going on in their heads than what's in the textbook. Thinking more about, am I going home to a house tonight or am I going to sleep in the car again? There's a lot that's going on in a kid's brain that we don't always see. When we talk about poverty, we're also looking at how uh, unemployment affects that group. Here, though, you see men advertising their skills, trying to obtain work. They can obtain even a day's work. That means money in their pocket that they can feed their families with. So thinking about all of these issues and aspects of poverty, how then does poverty impact students at school? And as you, I'm sure, are already thinking, it impacts them in many ways. How many times I myself have thought, if they could only arrive at school on time, how nice that would be. But for those who are struggling to even get to school, getting there on time is not always their main priority. And while this may look a little funny, it is true. You can't get marked tardy in, for class if you just don't go. And kids begin to realize that at a very early age. And we see with those who are in poverty, a much higher uh, incident of tardies and a much higher incident of absenteeism. And in fact, here's a bar graph of absenteeism, the dark blue representing students who live in poverty, you can see that the absenteeism is much higher for all of those students.
the effects of poverty on the brain are staggering because the brain does change. The brain changes. It has the ability to grow as we learn. It also has the ability to shut down. So as the brain is offered less and less stimulation, the brain can retract and uh, become more stagnant. Not that it doesn't grow, but that it grows at a much uh, slower pace because the trajectory of the brain has become um, uh, it, less is expected of it. For students that come to us in poverty, they encounter not only the challenges that we talked about in terms of like physical things, but in terms of these uh, educational things, there's cognitive lags. There's visual cognition, uh, visual cognition's poor for children of poverty, lower IQs, because the brain hasn't been encouraged and motivated to stretch and grow. It hasn't had enough um, opportunity to be promoted to grow. And there's been a lot of tests done where children with low IQs have seen significant change when the right kind of stimulants and uh, opportunities were given to them. Definitely uh, slower vocabulary development. And in fact, one of the statistics that probably has gripped me the most and, and disturbed me the most is uh, one from the book, Teaching of Poverty of Mind by Eric Jensen, when he says that a mother, a mother living in poverty has a smaller vocabulary than a five-year-old from a middle-class family. Now, I've got grandchildren, they're two, four, and five, and their vocabularies are incredible. And to think that a mother in poverty has a less vocabulary than my four and five-year-old is a staggering thought. And to think that these kids come to us then ready to learn, um, maybe not so much, right? So there's a lot that they come to us with these these cognitive lags and they are not in the same position that a middle middle income family would come to us with. So what can be done? What can teachers do to help these students who come with such deficient skills? Well, we can build core skills in them and building core skills includes things like building their attention and focus skills. And as we go through this, be thinking about how all this relates very specifically to social studies. What can we do as social studies teachers to develop their attention and focus skills? Now, not only in terms of uh, social studies, but thinking about things like video games help students to develop attention skills. While we don't wanna overdo video games by any stretch of the imagination, they do help to develop attention skills. I know uh, in Active Classroom, because that's one of the main products in which I, I work, there's some video games in there from Colonial Williamsburg that are just so much fun for middle school students. And I would think that if I had middle school students, that's one of the ones I would really wanna focus on is uh, the Colonial Williamsburg activities. We can build short and long-term memory, help, enforce and build those skills. And we can do that through a variety of ways. I think about when uh, when I was in the classroom, I'm not in the classroom any longer. I made all kinds of board games and matching activities, like the kind you turn face down and then they have to turn over, matching activities, puzzles, anything like that could really help to strengthen their short and long-term memory skills. So those are some things that we may go out and purchase that are already designed, or we may even choose to build and design ourselves based on particular uh, content. This is one that's really great for our area, is being able to teach sequencing and processing skills. We teach sequencing skills all the time in social studies. We just don't always call it out and say, hey, everybody, we're teaching sequencing skills today. But we do that, we teach students about events and how one event leads to another or how one event uh, impacts or affects another, cause and effect. We teach those things and those kinds of 
skill building activities uh, will really help those students who are coming from uh, deficit areas. Problem solving skills, and again, a great skill that is learned in the social studies. Think perhaps about maybe listing out for students uh, the problem solving skills that you want them to use. We ask them to problem solve in social studies frequently. Some of my favorite activities in active classroom, I hope a lot of you have active classroom, is uh, decision making activities where students have to take on the role of a real person who had to make real life uh, choices. They might have been politicians or uh, or maybe even just skilled laborers, but they, they're making particular decision choices. And their problem solving skills that we're asking the students to use in that activity teaches them that there are consequences for our choices. And so I love that activity, decision making. Another uh, great problem solving uh, activity that we have is in the C3 inquiry arc. Uh, I love those as well. So anytime that we're giving students opportunity to solve problems, giving them the uh, tools to do that with. So you can't expect these kids to have problem solving skills, but rather you're going to build their problem solving skills. So give them the problem and then give them the tools to build it with. If you've got active classroom, another great problem solving skill is uh, history's mysteries is a CSI approach to social studies. So they start out with they have a crime scene and a coroner's report, detectives research, and they have a problem. They're solving a crime and they're gathering evidence and they have to analyze the evidence and, and come to conclusions. So anything along this line that we do in social studies, we are teaching the skill. So not just assessing the skill, but teaching the skill. Uh, we want to teach about perseverance and ability uh, to change their skills in long term. So sometimes we have to help them do long term projects. And if we're going to have them do long term projects, maybe give them like checkpoints in between so that you can have opportunity to check in on their work. And of course, in the social studies, what better place to teach social skills, collaborative work, having them work with a partner, teaching them how to interact with others in an appropriate way great place for us to give that kind of instruction is in our own classrooms. And of course, we can instill hopefulness and self-esteem in them. We can encourage them and teach them about a more hopeful future. We can instill that in everything that we do in our classroom by our positive mind growth attitude that things can change and that things can be more positive. A growth mindset allows us to see that the brains can grow and it encourages us to find ways to help the students grow their brains. They can grow their brains through the video games that I mentioned a moment ago. Is a, a video games help to uh, improve attention skills. Intensive language training has been shown to have measurable changes in the brain intensive language training, spatial navigation abilities, again, can help to grow the brain. And anytime we're teaching students new skills, these new skills increase the brain's processing speed and the structural size of the brain. So we're giving them those new skills that, again, thinking about those generational students who come to us from poverty, they are not oftentimes talked to by the parents or the caregiver about how to make decisions or how to do new things. It's more about survival than learning uh, for future. So we have to give these students these great examples and opportunities in our classroom for them to grow their brains. Keep in mind that the IQ is not fixed. Some factors that that impact the IQ are home environment and living conditions. But think about the amount of time they spend in your classroom. The amount of dura and duration of schooling can also impact their IQ. So while they may have negative consequences and influences at home and the classroom, we can give them those positives that can increase their IQ. Early childhood experiences and early educational intervention, again, can also increase 
the IQ. And quality of nutrition also impacts IQ. So uh, that's hence one of the reasons why so many schools across America make sure that children have breakfast and lunch. Uh, when we talk about our brains growing and its ability to grow, anything that we can do in terms of problem solving, pattern recognition, or abstract thinking, reasoning skills, we are giving students an opportunity for those brains to grow. Think about the things that you already do in the classroom where reasoning skills have to be applied. Think about the things where they have to problem solve. You're already doing much of this, but put that uh, emphasis on these things of them being the learner, them doing the inquiry. By them doing the inquiry, we're giving them an opportunity for their brains to grow and for their IQs to grow. Uh, they need to learn about context-independent activities, highly transferable skills. Reasoning skills are not used just in the social studies classroom, though that's a great place to teach them. They're transferable skills that can be used in places, even in their home or in their community, and we, we need to help them make those connections of how reasoning skills and problem-solving skills can be applied in other places other than in just the classroom and in the activities that we're giving them. Here are some things that will change the brain, that will grow the brain and that will grow the IQ. Brainstorming activities, mind maps, pre-writing activities, graphic organizers, helping students to set and meet objectives, physical activity also. And one of my favorites is playing chess. I don't play chess, but I've seen some great impact that chess has had on students who come from poverty. The ability to keep their attention, to have a focus, to be problem solvers. Art also impacts and changes the brain as well as, and this one is key for all of us in education, building healthy relationships changes the brain for the positive. So my question today is where will you begin? I'd like to offer you a few items of inspiration. Much of what I've offered you today in the webinar came from two books, Teaching with Poverty in Mind and Engaging Students with Poverty in Mind, both by Eric Jensen. Another of my favorites is a movie by the name of Freedom Riders. If you've not seen it, let me encourage you to go out and see it. Not only have I seen the movie, but I've seen one of the original Freedom, Freedom Riders speak and their story is incredible. The Life of a King is about a man who teaches high school students how to play chess and how their ability to play chess leads to their ability to think through problems that they're encountering on the streets, whether or not to sell drugs, whether or not to get involved in a gang. So all of these uh, are very inspirational to me and I encourage you to take a look at some of these. I hope that you have enjoyed the webinar today on poverty. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed seeing what we've offered. We know that poverty impacts students in a very negative way, but we know that as teachers and through social studies, we can impact and change their brains in a very positive manner. If you have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear from you. You can use the uh, comment and chat button